What's up everybody? Today I'm going to be breaking down my recent mini documentary called Seeking Swells. This was actually released back in February, but since I've entered it into a local uh, film festival, I might as well break down some of it, just kind of generate some interest. I'm just going to do a commentary as we watch the film, kind of breaking down how things were shot, uh, any interesting trivia about uh, the scenes or the shoot locations, and uh, any technical details as well. And just kind of go through the whole film and um, just give a little background story to how it was shot and put together. Seeking Swells is a mini documentary I put together back in January on my trip to Costa Rica. It originally spawned as just kind of a one of those travel videos that I like to do. But as I arrived, I decided I wanted to break down each of these surfing locations. Some of them are well-known, some lesser-known surf beaches. And maybe interview a local or somebody, uh, some surf, prominent surf figure in the area to kind of give a little history to how the scene started. And as I made my way around the country, I would shoot a little bit of B-roll, some GoPro uh, stuff as I actually surf these beaches. So I had a personal perspective and then just kind of traveled and made my way throughout the, uh, the country from the, uh, the East Coast, the Caribbean Coast, all the way to the lower west coast and visit some of these surf beaches that I heard so much about. So let's go ahead and play the documentary and get started with this uh, director's commentary of Seeking Swells by filmmaker Chris Crass. Costa Rica, the rich coast. Nearly 800 miles of beaches were so all of these scenes here at the beginning, they were actually shot on my second or third last day in Costa Rica. I actually had surfed this beach earlier in the day and I could see the beginnings of a sunset. There were no clouds, so it wasn't going to be a, a dramatic sunset, but um, there was no clouds to get in the way. And um, I could see the conditions were lining up for a really good sunset. The only problem was that uh, here, I'm going to continue to play and mute it for now. The only problem was that I came here with just my surfboard and it's not really safe to have your, uh, your gear in the car and leave it parked by the beach. So this was about 10 to 15 minutes away from the hostel, not too far uh, from the hostel where I was staying. But I finished my surf session, you know, a couple hours before sunset and I rushed back to the hostel to pick up the gear because I wanted to shoot this amazing sunset. And then they happened to be doing some uh, construction, some tree trimming on the road. And so there was about a 10 minute wait. And, you know, long story short, I basically made it barely in time to catch the sunset. If you go and see the sun where it is over here, this is when I started shooting. So the sun was already on its way down. And once the sun is on the horizon, it drops really quickly. So I had really just 10, 15 minutes to get these shots and it really came together really well because the inspiration for this uh, documentary was the classic Endless Summer documentary, surf documentary. And it starts out with these same kind of very golden uh, sunset scenes. And I kind of wanted the same vibe. The whole documentary carries the same kind of vibe. It's a little bit, uh, little bit quirky, kind of funny, some, some scenes and, and, and just the, the voiceover style. I really was uh, very much inspired by the Endless Summer and this opening sequence just tied everything together perfectly. There's a little bit of shake here, which the warp stabilizer wasn't doing a good job of getting rid of. So I ended up leaving it in there and, um, and that's how it came out. So this drone stuff was actually shot after the sun went down. And these scenes are actually from uh, Pavones, which was the, one of the last locations, the second to last locations that I visited on my trip in the uh, southwest, pretty much southernmost point of the country. And it had just these amazing prehistoric rocky beaches. And I got really lucky with the sunset there as well. So I had some, uh, some handheld footage that I shot and I also flew the drone, which I believe is in one of these next shots. Coming real close right here. You can see the splash as I just narrowly get the drone all wet. These sunrise scenes are actually in Manzanillo, which is near uh, Puerto Viejo, one of the, or the first location technically that I visited. Um, it's a little national park and just had this amazing tree here. I shot a lot of photos here as well. And since it's all golden, 
golden hour footage, it just ties in well, even though the previous footage is all sunset. It's like this that sparks something inside of us. There's a time lapse in uh, Pavonis. And the title seeking swells, I know it's kind of generic sounding, but um, I really, I'm, I'm, I think I'm usually pretty good at coming up with titles for things, but I didn't really have any like, I was trying to take a piece of somebody's interview, maybe some kind of motif that, that was repetitive throughout the documentary, and I just couldn't find anything that really fit. So, um, so I'd rather give it a generic name here, and then the subtitle over here, Costa Rican Road Trip, kind of describes what this Seeking Swells is. And it kind of is a summary of the entire trip because when you're planning a surf trip, you're seeking or chasing down these swells, looking at forecasts and trying to uh, be in the right location at the right time, which is, when you're dealing with nature, it's not always uh, the most easiest thing to, to do. There's two ways to plan a surf trip. You can keep a watchful eye on forecasts and charts and when the conditions line up. So this screen capture and um, the second best option these close-up shots were all shot on my return. Book your flight and pray. And I just pretended like I was uh, preparing for the trip. Documentaries are not always uh, purely factual because they're not video journalism. So you do have a little bit of flexibility with the narrative of, uh, of these... Uh, the way the story is told in, in the documentaries. Most of this driving footage was shot with my DJI Osmo because when I go on my, my trips I always shoot vlog footage, BTS vlog footage with the Osmo and since I was on the, alone on this trip I couldn't really hold the uh, GH5 and shoot steady uh, driving footage and it would just be too inconvenient so I shot all this with Osmo and just incorporated it into the dock and, and cut the aspect ratio to fit accordingly. My first stop was the tiny town. These maps, uh, map graphics were all done in After Effects and you can just customize the little route and the uh, start and end points on the template. Puerto Viejo, a four hour drive through jungles, mountains, and beautiful coastlines. These car shots were actually not me in the car, but I found a car similar looking to the one that I was driving. Uh, again, since I was alone, I can't drive and fly the drone at the same time. So this was actually on one of the last days after that opening uh, beach shot, I went up to visit this location in the mountains. And there was just this cool road coming through here with the trees and with the drone. And, it's, and with the long focal length of the drone, I really liked the lens compression effect and so I pretty much just stayed in the air and waited for cars that looked like the one that I had rented coming through and I uh, knew in advance that I was going to cut these into um, some part of the driving sequence. This is the city of Puerto Viejo. You see it's a one road kind of town, really busy, very touristy, people around everywhere. And so I arrived there at night and um, pretty much was setting myself up the next morning, did some surfing. And this gentleman over here is uh, Kurt Van Dyke. I was actually introduced or told about him by someone at the hostel. I was just asking him if, asked the guy at the hostel if he knew anybody, some kind of surf, prominent surf figure who has been in the area. And he, this Kurt actually fit the description perfectly. And he uh, is, he's from Hawaii, from Southern California, and had been, had moved to Costa Rica about 37 years ago. So the perfect person. And I asked him about the local beaches here. And then in order to uh, make the documentary connect as I was visiting multiple locations, I would ask him about locations that I was visiting, uh, anybody that I should ask for there. And everything really uh, tied together really well. Costa Rican people knew of it, and around the world it was kind of still an underground wave. You know, it's, it never became famous. It was hard to get to in the past. It was all gravel road. There was no electricity here or nothing. That's Kurt, a local surfer who's been in the area for over 30 years. 
He's is Kurt's hotel? He's also a surfboard shaper. My name's Kurt Van Dyke. I was born in Santa Cruz, California. Pretty much grew up in Santa Cruz, you know, most of my life. I did some surfing in San Onofre where my grandparents lived and stuff. And then in Hawaii where my uncle Fred lived. Kurt's uncle Fred Van Dyke was a pioneer big wave surfer in Miami Bay. And so Kurt began ripping pipeline from a young age. So all these photos were given to me by Kurt. Yeah, my friend Garcia. If you look at them, they're, they're film photos. And uh, he took a photo of, of the photos with his camera, his cell phone. And so it's not the highest resolution and they were not very well taken care of. So there's splotches and, and all kinds of blemishes everywhere. So I cleaned these up in Photoshop and just made them a little bit cleaner, did some editing with the colors. Um, I was gonna do some animation, some of that kind of 3D, 2D After Effects animation with these, but uh, due to their really poor resolution, I decided to just keep them as is and just clean them up a little bit. Yeah, my friend Gar Seagraves have been sending me pictures of... Uh, you see the focus is a little years, off sometimes because he kept leaning forward and backwards, and, enjoy, and then you know, sometimes he would stand up, so I would have to reframe. These drone shots were shot on my last day in Puerto Viejo as I was leaving pretty much. I went for one more surf session at uh, Salsa Brava, which is the beach that he's talking about. And so I had to get some footage. The, the swell didn't actually hit Salsa Brava until maybe like a week or so, two weeks after, and it actually hit the next area that I went to, Puerto Limon. But uh, they weren't the best waves when I visited. There was a smaller beach that you'll see some footage of, uh, Cocles, which had some, some nice, fun little waves, but it wasn't uh, the best time. I actually planned the whole trip for this big swell that was coming, and it ended up being shifted um, like a week or two later. And so I kind of just had to deal with what I had here. And um, you'll see I actually contacted some people on YouTube who had footage of Salsa Brava and all these beaches on their best days or pretty close to their best days and I got their permission and included them in the documentary because I didn't want to have just my footage of these smallish looking waves when um, I'm kind of building up the history behind these beaches. And the break he's referring to? It's known as Salsa Brava. So this is all footage that I got from uh, some people on YouTube. So you can see it's a lot bigger than, well, you'll see later how it was when I was there, but pretty decently sized waves, very hard to surf. The reef is right down here. So um, Kurt explains, if you watch the documentary, why it's so difficult to surf here, but um, there's some really fast, powerful barrels, and which is what gives it its name, uh, give it, gives it its name Salsa Brava, um, which is actually Salsa, and then the Brava was added later. Some more low res photos that Kurt gave me. Unfortunately, when I was in town, it couldn't look. So there was pretty much two, one or two people surfing when I was there because it, it just wasn't the right swell for it. But I would be remiss if I visited this location and I didn't get in the water, so. You know, they were rideable, had some fun surfing there, and, you know, I could say that I surfed Salsa Brava, so that was worth it. Kurt told me of a consistent beach break just down the coast called Portless. So here's where I took some liberty with the, uh, with the narrative of the story, because I actually was staying at a hostel near this beach, Cocles, and I didn't meet Kurt to my last day in Puerto Viejo. But um, just to make it make more sense in story form, I um, made it seem like he told me about this beach and then I went to visit it. And it's just how it goes with documentaries. It's a slight twisting of the truth, you know, not to make up anything, but just to make things make more sense uh, narratively.
So you can see the, the waves weren't the biggest, but there were some people out here and, you know, small tubes that you couldn't really make it out of, but they were definitely fun waves to surf. There's a couple clips here from the left side of Coquelis. The main break was the other side. This is the, uh, the left side where the waves break a little bit differently. There, there's a little bit of a paddle out to the island, but um, in some ways a little easier to ride because they don't break right on the beach. A trip to the Caribbean coast isn't complete without a visit to some of its many national parks. The most famous of which is Comitas. So all of this footage was shot on my uh, two sunrise trips, two sunrise visits to this area in Manzanillo, where you saw that scene from the, uh, the opening drone shot. And um, I shot some time lapses there, as you can see, and got some, uh, some drone stuff. And then this ship was also in Manzanillo, but a little bit further up the beach. Just a cool little scene. There was a, there was a few ships uh, wrecked out there. Here you can experience a slice of Costa Rica's diverse selection of wildlife. And so these extreme close-up shots, you would think they were shot with a uh, macro lens or something, but to be honest, when I'm traveling or when I'm hiking, especially, I have to be so minimal with my gear that I'll have. Obviously, my two time-lapse cameras, my photo camera, my video camera, and pretty much just one, one lens on each. Um, maybe I'll bring an extra wide and the gimbal if I have space. But uh, all these close-up shots with this nice bokeh was shot on a kit, Panasonic kit lens, 14 to 140, variable aperture, you know, nothing, nothing fancy at all. But uh, I shot it from a pretty far distance, zoomed in, so you get that blurred out background and it, uh, it looks pretty good for, for what it is. These were some monkeys that, um, those were howlers. This is the capuchin. The sloth I pretty much only saw at the end I was, as I was making my way out. They're just so high up in the trees, they're hard to find. And then they have raccoons there, uh, wild raccoons, which I guess are native to the area. It's another howler monkey over here. Close up of this cool looking spider. And this guy stole uh, somebody's protein bar and started uh, opening it up and started eating it. Look for uh, Kekas, he does boat rides to the island. And the island of Limon is uh, pretty much close to world class on a good day as you can get it. So this guy, Tekas, that he was talking about, I didn't actually end up meeting, but he had other people working for him that did the boat rides. And um, I'll cover that a little bit more when I get to that Puerto Limon spot, but it was a pretty cool experience. Slap. Um, it was a pretty cool experience. You just, and got really lucky. I, I snuck this in really at the last day. So after a couple days in Puerto Viejo, I drove up to Limon, which wasn't too far, still on the Caribbean coast. And I uh, went up there to check out the beaches that they had. So this is uh, the beginning of Puerto Limon. As you can see, it's, it's a little bit uh, kind of like a beach ghetto. Um, to, to be honest, I was actually kind of surprised when I got there because some people have told me, you know, just to be about my wits when I'm there, especially with the camera gear, because it's, uh, it's a port town and a little bit dangerous, a little bit of crime and stuff. And, you know, you kind of get that vibe, you know, you, you just be reasonable. Uh, don't leave gear in open sights. You don't walk around with expensive stuff. Um, so I didn't do any actual sunrise shoots, like photography stuff that I was doing in the other areas, just because I, I even the, the Airbnb that I was staying at, there was just shady looking characters on the corner there, just kind of hanging out. And um, I really didn't wanna, because I had the two housings with me, I had the, the drones, the five cameras, all this stuff. And I didn't wanna make myself um, looking like a victim. So this, this guy, Manolo, uh, he's a surfboard shaper and I actually, so when I arrived at Limon, I went surfing on the first day to uh, Playa Bonita, 
and um, that's the main beach in, in Limon. And I surfed on the right side there. And then the next morning, I surfed in the morning and I came back, I went home, I came back with the housing because I can't leave the housing in the car also because of uh, danger of theft. And so when I was in the water with the housing taking photos, that's when I met this guy, Manolo. And he ended up being a, a very key figure to the story um, of this documentary. I'm gonna just play a little bit of this. That's Manolo, a local surfer and shaper I met in the water that morning. So technically it was the second morning. I got some cool slow-mo footage of him shaping the boards, fit in perfectly as he was describing. And this is all with the 14 to 140, like these close-up detail shots. Because when I'm on the gimbal, I really can't be switching lenses. This is really running gun, so I'll put the 14 to 140 on there. I'll get those close-ups. I can get these wides and um, shoot manual focus, so the the focus isn't really an issue. And I can surprise. I can get surprisingly good shots. This was two camera angles. One was the uh, the 50 millimeter. No, one was the uh, 24 millimeter um, Lumix lens. It's a 1.7, I believe. And then I had the uh, my Sony photo camera, which is actually this shot, with the 18 to 105 f/4. Uh, just kind of as a backup. I knew the colors weren't going to really match, but I just wanted to have two angles just in case and gave it a little bit more of a cinematic look. So this drone stuff was shot on my last day also because I had a, this is my car actually down here. So this was the main parking lot, but there was a bar and stuff. So I wasn't sure if they would tow your car there. And um, so I'd park down here. And then actually on my first day here, when I went surfing, I hit this side and I left my sandals on the beach. And there were some, some kids here, some little hoodlums. And I, I didn't really suspect anything was going to happen with my sandals. But when I came back, when I got back out of the water, uh, the sandals were gone and they were making their way down, down this part of the beach. So, uh, yeah, I got my sandals stolen on the first day and then I didn't buy new sandals until like the end of the second day. So as I was coming back surfing in the morning, I stepped on a rusty nail over here because this is all like rough construction stuff. And it kind of messed me up for a little bit because I thought I was going to have to get a, a TB booster shot or something and it was all swollen. But um, it ended up getting better and I didn't have to worry about it. This is the main break over here on the left side, which as you can see there's waves. Uh, it was a little bit bigger the day before, but um, on a good day, like the waves here are amazing. And I'm just going to cover Manolo's story since I'm not really going to be playing through this. It, was, it's, it ended up being a key part of the documentary because I was just originally going to go beach to beach, get a little bit of history, and I didn't really have any plan of tying this all together. But Manolo told me about how the main surf scene was actually in Puerto Limon and Playa Bonita and the island over here. It wasn't actually a surf destination. And then there was this big earthquake in 1991 and it kind of just shifted the beach. I think it lifted up the reef or something and so the waves are not as good now as they were before uh, 91 and, and that whole big surf scene kind of ended and then in, in, in doing so the, the surf scene spread throughout the country and that's where you have Hako, the more, probably the more touristy, the most popular surf beach um, in Costa Rica and then people started going more often to the island over here and it kind of, it was a bittersweet kind of situation obviously there is destruction and, and death you know there's a few people who died it wasn't that big of an earthquake and but you know a lot of damage to property but um it really impacted the surf scene and created this narrative that i was able to weave throughout the uh the whole documentary and just completely completely spontaneous just through asking the questions because i didn't really know uh, too much before I started talking to Manolo on camera. So uh, it's one of those things in, in the documentary that, you know, in making documentaries where it just organically, uh, the story kind of reveals itself and then you kind of direct it through, from there. Break in Limon is a beach called Playa Bonita. On the right is Los Tumbos, a fast and powerful bear, more suited for bodyboarding, but still surfable. On the far left is the main reef break of Playa Bonita. A slabby Bali like wave when the conditions are right. Playa Bonita was the hub of a thriving surf scene in the 80s. So these uh, 
these photos, I actually, I did a lot of digging to find them. Um, I think some of the local surfers that I met later added me on Facebook and then kind of looking through their photos, I, I kind of creeped through their Facebook photos and I saw they were tagged in some older photos and I found somebody who had a few more of these, uh, a, sur a surfer who had visited in the 80s. And just through a lot of digging, um, I, I was able to put all these photos together and they're also very low resolution, but I, I cleaned them up a little bit. And um, it's, it's just really good to have the archival uh, photos. Uh, archival video would have been prefer preferable, but um, you know, video cameras were not very common back then, especially for surfers. This is actual news footage from the earthquake, which I just cut little pieces that I found on YouTube. So you can see there's quite a bit of destruction here. You know, the roads got all torn up. So this footage is not from that 1991 prior 80s era um, archival footage, but it's some stuff that I found on YouTube of that beach, Playa Bonita, probably about five years ago or something. Uh, another person I contacted and, and, and included the, uh, right here, this guy, um, included in the video, in the, uh, in the documentary, uh, just because it was pretty big, to be honest, when I was there, but you can see the way these waves are breaking really fast, really powerful, really shallow. Luckily it's a sand bottom, so it's not too dangerous, but it's some gnarly waves here. And this is on the left side that I got with the, uh, the housing. And there's a video that Manolo sent me from the right side, I believe. And this is mostly bodyboarders that go here, so to surf and get barreled in these waves is pretty badass. I uh, ate a lot of shit just dropping in on these waves. And this is a mix of uh, the day that I surfed on the left side and on the right side. Some photos I shot with the housing. Told me about a dilapidated neighborhood at the south end of town that both saved. So this is another uh, uh, example of me taking liberty with the narrative. Um, I actually heard about this beach that I'm going to from another surfer in the water that um, from the first day, and um, he told me about this beach, kind of on the road as you're getting into town um, by the little uh, surf beach ghetto and uh, beach break. And it was supposed to be full on this day. And actually, you can see me driving here. And as I got there, there was four kids in the water that, uh, that were just leaving. Because there are waves, but not, not the best, at least for them. For me, coming from Miami, we, you know, we surf anything. So you can see there's waves out here. And the kids were just about to leave. And I told them, you know, just go in there, get some footage, uh, get, catch some waves. I'll get some footage. And I'm making this little documentary and stuff. So it kind of peer pressured them into going back in these kids right here. And then as soon as they got in, um, some people approached me on the beach, some other kids kind of asking what I was doing and kind of the word spread out real quickly that I was there shooting for a documentary, which, you know, it's just me, but I don't know, I guess, you know, you see somebody with a camera, you know, and, and so like more and more kids started showing up. Some people started showing up and, um, and then, those first group of kids weren't that good, and then these kids that could really rip ended up showing up, and I got some cool photos and video of them. And one of these guys, I'll show you, um, he actually told me that they were going to the island the next day. Even though it wasn't the best, there, was sh there still should be uh, some waves there, a little bit of a swell. And uh, he introduced me to the, to the guy who works for Tecas that Kurt spoke about, and we, this guy, Marco... Marco Picado, I don't know if that's his real last name, but uh, another old schooler, and we made the arrangements to, to go to the island the next day. The trouble was that I actually had to drive back to the airport to return the car. I was switching the, uh, 
the sedan for a 4x4 vehicle because on the west side of the country the roads are more rugged and some of the beaches I was going to visit I needed the 4x4. So it was a really tight thing fitting this in uh, in the morning because it's a three hour drive to the airport and to make everything in time three hour drive to the west coast it was going to be tight but it was going to be my only chance to get this footage of the island which is really key to the story so I just went along with it and then and made it happen. This kid was probably the best out of the group. Him and the other one that was uh, constantly getting pretty big airs. Si me pones a escoger, yo me quedo con la isla. El tema es que no había no había botes que lo llevan a uno. Yo recuerdo las peripecias para ir, ¿no? So part of the reason why Isla Ovita, the island, wasn't a popular spot, surfing spot was because of the difficulty in getting there. There wasn't a boat as there is now. This is uh, me on the little ferry boat um, getting to the island, which is a quick trip. It's, it's like 10 minutes. But before he, to he told me before they actually used to paddle, you know, it's probably like half hour, 40 minute paddle, but it's still pretty, uh, pretty badass to paddle all the way out here and then start surfing and then have to paddle back all the way at the end of your session. So it's understandable why it wasn't that popular of a surf spot. Antes del terremoto eran mucho más grandes, mucho más grandes las olas. El arrecife era más profundo. So this gentleman, his name was Tano, and nobody really told me about him. And then when I got on this trip, the somebody explained to me who he was, and he like pretty much grew up in the area, had been here his whole life, and uh, everybody knows him. You know, even on the on the original video on on YouTube, people have left comments saying that they know him, that they met him. So he's he's a he's a popular, he's an important guy. A uh, good surfer too, and I didn't really have time to fit in an interview with him um, between getting to the island early morning, getting my own surf session in, and then trying to get some footage afterwards. Um, so, and then plus this guy on the boat, he was taking some some kids, some of those surfer kids fishing around the island, and so I was trying to get in contact with him because I had to be back to at the airport to return the car, and then finally I, I found the guy and he came to pick me up. And then me, him, and me, Marco, and Tano uh, headed back to the mainland. And I have, you can see the recorder right here on his necklace because he's not wearing a shirt and I couldn't clip a lapel mic to him. And I didn't want the cable running somewhere. So the audio wasn't the best. Plus there was the boat sounds going on. But I got some really key uh, sound bites from this interview, which kind of I used throughout the, uh, the beginning of the documentary and, and the last concluding uh, statement. He, he was just a, a really introspective guy he had great philosophy about about life and surfing and um and it was a really good like spontaneous interview i totally wasn't expecting it tano has lived in limon his whole life and has seen the beaches change over time firsthand Manolo sent me some photos to show up. So as I mentioned, these are the photos that Manolo sent me at the island. Really low res. This was some footage that I got from somebody on YouTube. You can see like on an on a big day, the waves are just like huge and awesome and like very few people, which is just rare for for waves that are this good. One of the surfers that came with us on the trip. This is some shots from the boat, just handheld. And this is where we well, unloaded. Was nowhere near its peak potential. And you can see at the beginning there were some waves. They, they ended up dying down towards the end. I got I got some good rides in. And then I tried to paddle it back out with the housing, uh, trying to jump off the dock and paddle out here, but the current was just so ridiculously strong. And Marco, he kind of forgot to tell me that People don't usually, when the photographers come to shoot videos, they don't usually swim out to the break um, because of that current. They usually get dropped off by the jet ski or they just shoot from a little boat or something, kind of like uh, Tia Hopu style. But um, yeah, I spent like half hour like struggling against the current and got nowhere. And he was like, oh yeah, by the way, I forgot to tell you that people don't usually swim out there. And I was like, thanks Marco. Get some nice ones under my belt.
yo pienso que son como ciclos, cada cierto tiempo aparecen esos nuevos oleajes y, y son, es decir, ahora por ejemplo, en, en un par de semanas cambia completamente, en un par de semanas vamos a tener un oleaje grande. So he kind of dropped this little tidbit here casually that uh, in a couple weeks there was going to be a huge swell and I didn't think too much of it um, and then I st as I got back home I started looking at the uh, forecast and I saw these uh, photos and videos coming out of that beach on the island and I I was just like completely amazed like if I had shifted my my whole trip just a week and a half one week later I would have been able to surf these just crazy amazing waves here and uh, this footage I also got from some people on YouTube and Instagram and you can see these waves are just crazy huge this is the big swell coming in and like that just it's just crazy and and apparently it's like it probably happened once or twice in the past um in the documentary itself i mentioned that something that's never been seen probably a little bit dramatic but it's just really amazing these waves here and i can't believe i missed it by a week or by 10 days and with uh with the internet and, and all that, you can see there was a lot more people in the water, but still, for something like this, that's not a lot of people and you could definitely catch a few without getting dropped in on. I couldn't resist skipping over to the southwest part of the country to visit some famous breaks I had heard so much about. So, as I mentioned, I left, um, I left Puerto Limon or I left the island, zipped back to Puerto Limon, went to the Airbnb, quickly got all my gear, and made the three hour drive to the airport, and then down to this location. Um, but I kind of didn't include that in the documentary because there's no really any point in it. These are some more of those shots that uh, I mentioned that I got on that last day. A little drone shot of the car, similar looking car coming through. This is actually in San Jose, the, air, the, the capital where the airport is. And it looks like I just kind of go through and just went straight over there, which would have been a six hour drive. If I made it straight, it ended up being more like seven or eight because I had to make a stop to pick up the car. By nightfall, I had arrived in the small town of Olita where a local dive shop had offered to let me join one of their tours. It's one of the best locations. So, this experience, as I was, as I was planning my Costa Rica trip, um, I wanted, I had the intentions of making this a little bit of a bigger production, and um, I, I hit up a bunch of tour companies, diving, whatever, adventure tours, to see if anybody wanted to let me do the tour for free in exchange for me cutting a small section of the documentary and being featured in the documentary. Um, and nobody really responded except for this, these guys, the uh, Costa Rica Dive and Surf, awesome group of people. And um, I did a few interviews. These were actually shot on the last day, on the third to last day, because I, I came to this town. This, is, this town is called Uvita, uh, the town where they take off from the uh, diving. And uh, I visited Uvita, did the diving, didn't have time to shoot interviews went to Pavones for a couple days and then came back to Uvita and then I went up to the mountains. So this was on that second visit and uh, this is one of the, uh, the tour guides here. Costa Rica Dive and Surf takes guests year round to local dive sites where the aquatic biodiversity is as abundant as on land. I'm Willie Vargas uh, and I'm one of the managers for Costa Rica Dive and Surf. You will get to see a lot of tropical fish. Had you know, some issues here you can see with the focusing because he was shifting and then we had to stop for a second because the, the power went out. So, missed focus on some of these, but when you're shooting, sh shooting solo, it kind of happens sometimes. Coming in and sea turtles around and different kinds of rays. After meeting at the dive shop, we geared up, loaded the boats into the water, and made the hour-long cruise to Caño Island. So they take the three boats out. It's about an hour, as I mentioned, to get to the island. This is actually footage shot on the way back. The dolphins we saw on the way there, um, kind of hard to catch because they're always underwater and then they pop out. And if you happen to have the camera pointing in the right direction, if you're lucky enough, and that's why I only got one jump there. And they follow you for a little bit and then 
the boat speeds up and you kind of leave them behind. But got that one cool jump and then the shot pointing downward with them underwater. You know, in hindsight, I should have had a polarizer to cut the reflection a little bit, but it was really run and gun. And this was also all shot with the famous 14 to 140 lens. While the visibility wasn't its best, there was no denying the beauty. So all this underwater shot, all this underwater stuff is shot with uh, with the GoPro as far as the video, because I was um, I have a Ike Light housing for my Sony A6300, but I was shooting photos on that, and I wanted to be as productive as I could, so I shot I left the GoPro running for most things and shot the photos, and these were the white tip sharks that we saw there. We saw white tip sharks on two. We, there's two dives that you go down, and so we saw them on both uh, locations, and a bunch of cool fish. Um, I actually cut my finger, I think this is part of the, the second dive, and I cut my finger catching the, the drone for the, uh, the establishing drone shots, and it stopped bleeding, but I don't know, there's some points where the sharks got a little close and I used the camera to kind of somewhat push them backwards, because maybe, uh, maybe they could smell the blood and water. Saw a couple sea turtle, turtles there, that was pretty cool, bluefin tuna. There's a seahorse over here. Eel. Selfie. These were the drone shots uh, shot with the Mavic. And we had to take off and fly off of the coast because this is all like a nature preserve and there's no drone flying allowed on the island, but since we were in the water, technically it's allowed. It's like going to the land of, of it's like going to like a, a children's playhouse. It's like fun. The most fun you can imagine. So I had my itinerary set, of course, and each of these people I interviewed, I would ask them about locations that I was going to visit down the line, just so I can do exactly what I did here, where the same interviewer uh, or same interviewee speaks about each location. I would just put it later in the documentary. And, um, and so Pavonis is, is a very famous spot known for uh, one of the longest lefts in, in the world. Um, Obviously, I didn't get lucky. I got the tail end of a swell, so on the first day there, I got some good waves, but um, didn't really get any surf footage there, um, un unluck unfortunately. But I got some, some footage from people on YouTube, and pretty much just one long wave, because the wave, the rides are so long that you'll see the footage here pretty soon, but uh, just that one, ra one ride shows you, like, how amazing the waves are there and if you know you're on the wave for like a minute or two your legs start to shake and it's a it's a really cool occasion when when the when the waves are right when the swell is going off you know you're almost there when the paved road ends and you're this is where i really needed the uh the four by four you don't see it so much here this is the beginning of it but then as i started to get closer it was all just rocky unpaved road up down steep steep roads these are uh, sunrise shots from my second day there. Two more drone shots from, um, from that same flight that you saw in the beginning of the video. You can see how low the tide was there. Yo, o sea, yo he alcanzado a ver, porque cuando lo surfeé, alcancé a ver a quienes sí podían correr la ola hasta el final, que pueden ser unos 600 metros. Otros dicen que hasta más. Pero 600 metros de una ola te tiemblan las piernas. O sea, es un ride bien largo. So this is the clip that I was talking about. Let's see. It starts at exactly... Nine, 19 minutes, 34 seconds. And I believe it was almost twice the length. Um, there was a little part earlier, but I just had to cut it because um, otherwise it would be just a long clip of one single wave. And I was gonna fit a second clip that I had after it, but uh, it was another long ride and it's just too much. It just shows you how, how amazing the waves are here. And this is by a guy named Six Tucker Mason. Ride, they're not kidding. With the right swell, rides at Pavonas can last up to a mile. Plenty of time to impress the girls standing on the beach. You see it just keeps going and going. 
And this drone pilot did a pretty good job keeping up and somewhat keeping the surfer centered in the shot. So we're almost about a minute. Yeah, it cuts right there. There's about 45 seconds plus with the little piece that I cut off. It's probably like a whole minute long uh, wave ride, which is it's not that uncommon, but it's, it's pretty rare. Here's Kurt leaning back, losing focus. You can see this day, this is the last day there. It was like no waves, no surfers. And these surfing shots were from the first morning there, um, where we had a tiny bit, of, tiny bit of waves, a little bit of a swell. Um, definitely not those super long rides, but um, you know, just enough that I could say I surf Pavonis. And actually, I was going to return after that surf session, come back with the housing as I did in Playa Bonita, but. Um, I had some issue with the Airbnb and, and, and the, the, a new person came to manage it, manage it and, and the, the person who was on the listing, she had moved my reservation to another bungalow and this whole thing. And so I lost like probably three hours there. And by the time I got back to the beach, the wind had picked up and the waves were gone. So I was a little bit annoyed with that, but you know, it is what it is. That's why I had to get the footage from somebody else on YouTube. On my last few days, I headed up to a fun little beach break called the Mini Cow where it breaks pretty consistently, even when it's not big. So Dominical is the, the beach that you saw at the beginning of the documentary, where I surfed there um, sunset or afternoon of that first day. That's where I got those video shots. And I think these are actually from, I think there's a mix here from that afternoon and from sunrise the next morning. I thought of the people I had met while chasing waves around this surfing paradise and the stories they had to tell. See these little barrels that you can just barely not get into. And this is uh, some of those really good like audio bits that Tano had, um, just like a very like spiritual uh, view on life and just tied everything together pretty well and plus my narration where I over -dramat dramatized you know the story which I mean it's true you know the the scene used to be really big in this Puerto Limon and then now there's a new generation of these kids that are you know trying to make their way up and there's like some famous Costa Rican surfers that are just recently getting acknowledged for their skill but I just kind of made it part of the narrative of the documentary and just by cutting certain pieces of the interviews, it made it all come together really well. With so many miles of beaches, what breaks are still out there waiting to be discovered? They're, they've told me about these mystical places. My friend uh, Brad, he's told me about some reefs and some sandbars that at high tide, they don't even break, they don't even exist. The tide goes up. And Kurt, Kurt went off on some tangents so I had to splice a little bit of his, uh, his interview to somewhat make it uh, like a coherent soundbite. That's why you get some visuals over um, when he's talking. But, um, you know, that's, the, that's part of the creativity of, of editing and making things uh, nice and concise. You fly over into local plains. You can look down and see these rides, huge 15, 20 foot rides. <clears throat> Nobody there, it's jet ski material. I thought of the re-emerging Limon surf scene and the potential talent, not just there, but in all of Costa Rica, waiting for their time to shine. You see some of these shots were from earlier, but um, it was part of my uh, kind of coming around and, and bringing a nice conclusion to the whole thing, tying together these last bits of interviews um, 
And so just kind of cutting between some of the footage that I shot earlier and making it all sort of make sense here at the end. And to be honest, Tana also went on some tangents. Um, so I had to cut up his interview a little bit. Um, and, you know, I'm fluent in Spanish, but some of the, the words and phrases he was using, I was trying to, I was having a hard time finding an English translation for it. So if you are a fluent Spanish speaker, you might see I took some liberties here with the translation. But it's, you know, it's the gist of his message. And it was a perfect little audio bite for the end. And that wraps this up. So there you have it. That's the director's commentary for my mini doc, Seeking Swells. A little bit of technical info and some, some background info on, on how this was all shot. I'd only put together one other quote unquote mini doc, the uh, Emerald Skies, the Iceland trip, which is more of a maybe a cinematic vlog than a, than a documentary, but just kind of, a, it's all a learning experience. And just watching a lot of other documentaries and, and seeing how the story evolves and how you sort of like humanize these characters and, and, and you find a story and expand on it with the interviews and expand on it with the editing plus the B-roll and everything comes together really nicely and, and just finding a way to put it all together into a nice uh, little storyline and follow the arc. There wasn't exactly a, a hero character arc in this uh, documentary is more uh, just kind of learning about these beaches but there is a little bit of a storyline there with discovering the surf scene in, in Puerto Limon and the earthquake and and then all these characters are talking about how the Costa Rica surf scene is sort of building itself back up and I just thought it was interesting nice little um, surf mini doc especially if you're into surfing learning about these beaches and, and just putting together some cool footage so hope you enjoyed this I'm gonna start to break down my uh, my travel videos, my edits, whether the documentary style or the quick travel edits, um, just to get a little behind the scenes process on how all this comes together because it requires a lot of uh, just a lot of work on location because I'm shooting photos at the same time and the vlog and all that and then all this work in the editing room to put it all together. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any comments or questions, leave them in the comments section below and be sure to like and subscribe for more of this travel content, whether photography, travel video, or documentary related stuff. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Mm -hmm.